Although their numbers are dwindling every year, there are still many people who remember and lived through the Holocaust during World War II. Michael Gruenbaum is one of these. He's a concentration camp survivor who has written with Todd Hazak Lowy a memoir of his experiences in a book for young people titled Somewhere There Is Still a Sun. But why a book about the Holocaust for young people? Will they forget what they've learned about that time in our history? I don't think it's a matter of forgetting. I don't think they know anything about it. You know, it's not been brought to their attention very much. In his own way, he's trying to bring the Holocaust to the attention of teens. And since he was a teenager during his time in the Nazi camps, he felt that kids today could relate to his life there. Gruenbaum starts his story before the war, when his family lived a very good life in Prague, Czechoslovakia. We lived very comfortable. My father was a very prominent and successful lawyer. We had a car, believe it or not. We were one of the few people that had a car. My father used it to go on excursions on the weekends and then to visit his parents, who lived about two hours away. And uh, we lived in a large apartment. We had a cook and a governess, and so we lived a very comfortable life. After Hitler's troops invaded, though, it was a different story for Gruenbaum and his family. We had to move from that apartment into a much smaller apartment in the ghetto. We had all kinds of restrictions. We had to sort of tolerate or get used to. Like, I wasn't allowed to go to school anymore. Lost six years of schooling during the Nazis. We were not allowed to go to any movies or parks. Uh, we had to sit in the back of uh, a streetcar. We had to turn in all our jewelry and radio and skis and bicycles and cars. We were not allowed to travel anywhere. We were allowed to buy groceries, only certain groceries, and we had to buy during a certain hours of the day. And I couldn't associate with any non-Jewish friends because that was not allowed. So we really were restricted severely. Living in the ghetto under those conditions was just the beginning. Gruenbaum says that the worst part of the Nazi occupation was yet to come. I was thrown away from my mother. You know, my father was already arrested while we were in the ghetto and was tortured and killed right away. But my mother and my sister and I ended up in Terezin in the camp. And the minute I arrived, I was no longer allowed to live with my mother. I was sent to a school building where I was assigned to be in room 7. And uh, the teacher there, the Badrich, he named it uh, Nesharim, that's like eagles. And so there were 40 kids in that room bunking together. And altogether, there were about 80 boys that went through that room during that two-and-a-half-year period that I was in. The camp was oppressive, but the boys that Gruenbaum roomed with did manage to find time to learn and have some fun allowed surreptitiously to get lessons from some very uh, important teachers there. And we had to work, of course. At the beginning, I had to work in the garden outside the fortress. And then later on, I worked in the bakery. My job was to transport goods to the various distribution centers. So we had to work a lot, but also we had some fun playing soccer. We performed an opera called Brundibar. So we got some enjoyment out of uh, singing and also making other kids in the audience happy when we were singing. Those boys who left during the time Gruenbaum was there were sent on transports east to a destination that no one at his camp in Czechoslovakia, Terezin, seemed to know about. People who left Gruenbaum's camp never came back and weren't allowed to write many letters back to their relatives. Those who did get permission had their messages heavily censored by the Nazis. But Gruenbaum's mother was very clever, and she worked out a code with her sister-in-law, who had been transported east. The agreement was that if the writing was slanting upwards, it meant that the destination was much better than Terezin. If the writing was uh, sloping downward, it would be worse. Gruenbaum's aunt did manage to send a postcard about her work as a seamstress at her new location, and the writing was slanted down. From then on, his mother was set on not letting Michael, his sister, or herself be transported away from Terezin. And he says she used everything she could think of to keep the family together and safe. We were already summoned to three different transports. And my mother was able to go to the people 
who made up the list and reminded them of all the good things that my father had done for the Jewish community in Prague and other parts of Czechoslovakia. And because of that, they pulled us out. Another time, Gruenbaum says his mother convinced the Nazis to keep them on because her work was vital to filling a large order of Christmas gifts for the SS to give at the holiday. We ended up in the assembly area, and our number was about 1350 out of the 1500. So that gave my mother a little bit of extra time, and she ran over to the place where she was working, which was the arts department. She went to her boss, and she said, look, uh, we got this order from the German SS man to produce these teddy bears for Christmas for his children and his friends' children, and this order will not get filled. You better tell him. So he went to the SS man and told him that, and the SS man said, why don't we pull her out of the transport? And uh, my mother's boss said, well, that's okay, but, you know, she has two children, and uh, if they go, she will want to go with them. So he said, all right, pull those out too, but nobody else. Another tragedy averted, but Gruenbaum and his family weren't out of the woods yet. Even the liberation of Terezin by the Russians in 1945 was fraught with problems. Just a few weeks before, some of the people that had been sent east was coming back, and they brought back typhoid. And so there was a typhoid epidemic in Terezin. And what happened was, even though we were liberated, they would not allow anybody to leave until the end of the month. So on one hand, it was jubilation that we were liberated. On the other hand, it was so dangerous because of the illness that spread there. When they finally got to leave, Gruenbaum says that their immigration to the U.S. didn't go through right away. Since there were quotas of how many people were allowed into the states, he and his family lived in Cuba for two years, where he attended an American high school. Gruenbaum says that his family was very lucky to have gotten out of the camp when they did, and his mother was responsible for making much of that luck. He said she was optimistic and persevering, and he titled the book Somewhere There Is Still a Son after a letter she wrote after Terezin was liberated. Gruenbaum shares the final paragraph of that letter. We do not yet know how the future will shape up for us. None of our old friends are alive anymore. We do not know where we are going to live. Nothing. But somewhere in the world there is still a sun, mountains, the ocean, books, small clean apartments, and perhaps, again, the rebuilding of a new life. I think it's such a fabulous letter. And that's where the uh, title for the book came from. Gruenbaum says that he has good and sad memories of his time in Terezin, and he hasn't forgotten about the other boys, now men, who inhabited Room 7 and managed to survive their ordeal despite the odds. I waited 43 years before I went back. And uh, when the communists were overthrown, I went back with my whole family. And then the next year, we set up a reunion of survivors of Room 7, and so we met there again, and altogether I've been there five times. We've been in touch all along, but we really didn't meet until 1992. We had our first reunion in Prague, and then we've met every four or five years since then. And the last one we had was in 2008. We met at the house of our teacher who survived and lived in Los Angeles. And he was 90. We were celebrating his 90th birthday. And there were 62 people. So uh, you can imagine how uh, we always said that Hitler would probably be turning in his grave if he knew about that. Gruenbaum says that he hopes his book will help young people learn about and appreciate the suffering that the Jews and others endured under Hitler and the Nazis. As he said at the beginning of our story, he's afraid that kids today are not being taught about the Holocaust. And he's happy about a program in his home of Brookline, Massachusetts, that is doing something about it. There's an organization here in Massachusetts called Facing History and Ourselves. And they have, for the last 35 years or 40 years, been trying to spread the word about genocide and what happened to the Jews during the Second World War. And so they now have 15,000 teachers all over the world teaching courses in that specific area. You can read about a young man's life inside a Nazi work camp in Czechoslovakia and his mother's efforts to keep her son and daughter alive in Michael Gruenbaum's memoir, Somewhere There Is Still a Son, available now at stores and online. 
For more information about all of our guests, log on to our site at viewpointsonline.net. You can find archives of past programs there and on iTunes and Stitcher. Our show is written and produced by Pat Reuter. Our production directors are Sean Waldron, Reed Pence, and Nick Hofstra. I'm Marty Peterson. Guys can be hard to buy gifts for, but this holiday, the Craftsman brand has perfect gift options for the DIYer and auto enthusiast on your list, or even for the guy who's looking to show his love for tools on his sleeve with new hoodies and hats. For example, the Craftsman Extreme Grip platform is designed to give you the grip you need to loosen rounded or rusted fasteners, making it quick and easy. The Craftsman Extreme Grip 5-piece socket accessory set offers solid gripping power on many kinds of fasteners, and the Craftsman Extreme Grip Diamond Tip Screwdriver offers four times more gripping power than standard black oxide finish tip screwdrivers. Quality and durability are assured. All Craftsman hand tools come with a lifetime full warranty. New apparel options are hot too, like the Craftsman 12-volt heated hoodie. It's designed for comfort, added warmth, and style. Great to wear while shoveling snow, working on an outdoor project, or for tailgating at the big game. And that's just the start. Check out the Craftsman Gift Finder on Craftsman.com, where shoppers can easily find the hottest gifts of the season all in one place.